It's a great delight to welcome you to our online service here at Trinity Church in Scarborough. I want to welcome you whether you are joining us from Scarborough itself or whether you are tuning in uh, from around the world. My name is Lee McMunn and I'm the Senior Minister of the Church and throughout the service we have an opportunity to sing God's praises, to hear from his book the Bible as it's read and proclaimed to us and to pray together to the great God of heaven uh, who is powerful, who is personal and who cares. Everything you need for the service will appear on the screen so all the lyrics of the songs and uh, the prayers that we'll say together. Uh, at a certain point you may want to uh, refer to a Bible, so we'd love you to have your Bible beside you. If you don't have a Bible, the best thing to do I think is to, uh, to get your phone, to find something like Bible Gateway, and then on that website you'll be able to uh, read the Bible passages uh, that will be read and preached uh, today. As we prepare to sing together, I want to read some verses from Psalm 105 and then pray, and then we'll sing. Psalm 105 says this, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to sing together, hear your word and pray, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts so that we would sing rightly to you, praise you for your wonderful acts, remind us of what you have done, remind us of who you are, and help us today as we come and gather around the scriptures that we would seek and receive fresh strength from you, our Father in heaven. And we pray all this for the glory and honour of Jesus. Amen. Our first song is called Come People of the Risen King. It's that call to the people of God, uh, those who follow not a dead Messiah, but a, a Jesus, a saviour who is raised, who is alive today. Uh, a call to these people to come and praise and live for Jesus their King. So let us sing together, come people of the risen King.
look forward to the day when all sin will be removed. But Christians, those who have their faith in Jesus, there is no condemnation that we have to fear, but we still battle with sin. And the Bible says that the penalty of sin has been removed because of Jesus. The power of sin has been broken, but the presence of sin remains. And therefore we battle to put to death uh, the sinful nature within. Uh, but until Jesus returns, that battle will continue. And therefore it's right as we gather together to confess our sins to Almighty God. So we're going to use a prayer that will appear on the screen as we think back to these last few days of our life, as we ponder the things in God's world uh, that we have done that God has commanded us not to do, uh, as we also ponder the things that God has commanded us to do that we have omitted to do, and we're going to say sorry to God. So as you ponder these last few days of your life, young or old, let us pray together using the words of this confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And Father, we cry out to you that this week your Holy Spirit would fill us afresh and make us more like Jesus. We pray that in our hearts and in our actions that we would think and feel and be like Jesus, our beloved Saviour. And we pray this for the honour and glory of his name. Amen. If you want to continue to keep up to date with the, the latest news of Trinity Church, do check out our uh, website, do check out our Facebook uh, page. One thing to highlight today, uh, from Tuesday, so from this Tuesday coming and uh, for every Tuesday, uh, we are starting something new called Trinity Tuesdays. So from 8 to 9 o'clock UK time uh, on Tuesday evenings um, on Zoom. And then the Zoom call will be broadcast live to Facebook um, and to YouTube as well. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to explore some of the big questions of life, uh, the questions around the identity of Jesus. Sometimes we'll do uh, some presentations, sometimes we'll do some interviews, sometimes we'll do um, a discussion about maybe a film that we've all asked people to watch and then we can listen to some input and how some of the big themes of the film and the movie connect with our questions and how that connects with uh, Jesus. Sometimes it'll be any question that you can throw in, a whole variety of things, but basically Trinity Tuesdays is, is a way for anybody, whether you've got faith or particularly if you're trying to work out some of the big questions, uh, to come and engage at any level you want. If you want to join the Zoom call, leave your video off and just and just see what people are doing. If you just want to view it on uh, YouTube or Facebook, whatever works for you. But it's a great way to find out the truth about Jesus, the truth about Christianity and get your questions answered. So um, we, we'd really encourage you to spread the word about Trinity uh, Tuesday. We're going to start on Tuesday night. Um, all the details, you can see some of that on the, on the screen. Um, but from this Tuesday, we're going to start by thinking about the question, is there a God? Um, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the, the evidence for God's existence, some of the evidence about what kind of God um, does exist. This will be ideal if you're, if you're trying to work out if there's a God or if you're a Christian and you want to know how to talk to friends and family. So tune in. Uh, we'll be looking at a whole variety of things. I'll be giving a bit of input. There'll be opportunities for questions. And then about, I'll be able to share some other resources um, as well. So Trinity Tuesdays. Starting uh, this Tuesday, do join us. We'd love to see you. Now, we do love our all-age teaching slots here at Trinity Church, so sit back and relax and enjoy the next episode. Hi there. Welcome to this week's Divine Delivery. Breaking news. Good morning. We're sorry to interrupt your divine delivery slot. We've just received news of an 
audacious robbery taking place on an island off the coast of Scarborough right now. I report on the image currently on the scene watching it all take place. Yes, Maxwell, I am on the scene and as we speak, there is a robber trying to steal this lady's car. As Henry sets off to find the police, will anyone come to save the lady and her car? Scarlet Arrowdash comes to save the day. And here she is, just in time. She acts quickly and knocks the gun out of his hand. She ties him up and knocks off his hair. The police are coming just in time. The policeman comes on his way to arrest the criminal. The policeman arrests him and takes him back to the boat. Well done, Scarlet Arrowdash. And off she goes to save another day. Wow, what a story. We all love stories about superheroes, don't we? Maybe we have a favourite one. Batman, Wonder Woman, Spider-Man. We love to hear stories about how they rescue people, how they save the day, how they defend those in need. <laughs> Hang on. I think that was the doorbell. Must be time for our divine delivery. Let's see what we've got in here then. Well, oh, we've got a superhero cape of some sort. And God is our defender. Well, we've been hearing about superheroes and stories who save people. But the Bible tells us that God uh, saves people in real life. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 17 and 18 say this for the lord your god is god of gods and lord of lords the great god mighty and awesome who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you giving them food and clothing stay safe isn't it amazing that the almighty all-powerful god chooses to defend the weak and the helpless. God's got a special heart for the least, the lost and lowest. Do you feel especially weak at the moment? We might sometimes feel strong, but when we think about it, we're not actually very powerful on our own. But when we become Christians, we come to God in weakness, knowing that we can't make his standards on our own, that we need a saviour. And God is a defender of those who come to him in weakness and helplessness. This means two important things for us. Firstly, we can trust God to be just. In this broken world, we'll suffer and experience injustice and evil. And when they happen, we might sometimes think, why doesn't God do anything? But it's good to know that we can trust God does see it. And though we might not always see how, he will bring justice for, for weak and helpless. Secondly, we can trust God to lead us safely home. God is our all-powerful, almighty defender. God doesn't promise us that life will always be easy, but he does promise to bring us safely home to him in heaven. Our next song is called The Ancient of Days. The song is based on the truths that we discover in Daniel chapter seven. It speaks of the eternal kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Ancient of Days, the Glorious Father sent His Son into the world to die on a cross for us and to set up a kingdom that will never finish. So let us sing together the Ancient of Days.
opportunity to join with Christians around the world and throughout history as we say the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, these words are based on biblical truths and as we say them together, uh, do imagine many millions of Christians who have said the same words uh, either today or throughout human history. We're very much not alone. Uh, we're part of the great company of the faithful who put their trust in Jesus. So let us say the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, we're going to have our first uh, Bible reading. Oliver Hutton, one of uh, the youngsters in our church, is going to read from Daniel chapter 4. And then after he's read the Bible, uh, we're going to have a time of prayer. And Mark and Monica, two of our church members, um, are going to interview uh, uh, one of our mission partners, Pastor Slavak, uh, in Poland, and his wife, Ivana. And uh, we're going to hear a bit about them and then they're going to pray for us and then we're going to pray for them. So first of all, the Bible reading and then the prayers. Today's reading is from Daniel chapter 4, verse 1 to 18. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and people of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. I was lying in, be in bed. The images and visions passed through my mind, terrified me. So I commanded that the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence. I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirits of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of magicians, I know that the spirits of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions that I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful and fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under the, the, it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the vision, what I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree, eat, and trim off the branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under its, and the birds from its branches. Let the stump and its roots, bound with the iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal, until seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by the messengers of the Holy One declares the verdict, so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, and gives them to anyone he wishes to and sets over them the loneliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, 
for none of the wise men in the kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Hello. Um, hello. Can I start by asking your your names and uh, your your how many children you have, if you have children, or what's your family like? Jaka jest nasza rodzina? Opisać. O. Znaczy, poznaliśmy się troszeczkę, jak byliśmy w zeszłym roku w Scarborough, więc nasza rodzina jest trzyosobowa, tak? Iwona i jeszcze mamy syna Janka. Pastor Słowak just said that they came to us um, last summer, um, last year, and visited Trinity. So um, they have three members of family. It's Pastor Sławek, Iwona and the son Janek. Ta duchowa rodzina jest o wiele większa. But the spiritual family is much, much bigger. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And where are you living now? Gdzie mieszkacie teraz? Mieszkamy w Polsce oczywiście. 20 km od, od Inowrocławia, gdzie służymy. Uh, they live in Poland, 20 kilometers uh, from Inowrocław, where they are serving. Okay. And um, what, um, what, what do you do in uh, Inowrocław? Uh, co robicie w Inowrocławie? Trochę powiedz o waszej służbie, o kościele. There are a few of us, so we, we need to do lots of things in the church. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, worshiping during the ser uh, service uh, and I've got helpers, I've got two girls, they play the guitar, they play the piano, so we are quite prepared for that, for this service. And uh, I'm uh, responsible for uh, Sunday schools for kids too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. To, to moja służba polega na tym, że jestem pastorem tego zboru, yeah. więc y, y, ogarniam jakby troszeczkę więcej niż, niż Iwona. Pastor Sławek just said he's been a, a pastor of an old church, so he's got a bit more responsibilities. Ale jakby moją główną, moim głównym zadaniem, moją główną służbą to jest głoszenie Ewangelii, tak? Głoszenie mm. kazań i prowadzenie nabożeństw. Mm -hmm. But his main responsibility is to preach the gospel and lead the um, services at church. Staram się, żeby też te moje kazania docierały do też osób, które nas oglądają czy na YouTubie, czy na Facebooku. I w ostatnim czasie y, właśnie ta sytuacja tego koronawirusa pokazała mi, że, że po prostu ludzie z zewnątrz chcą usłyszeć też Ewangelię, bo, bo widzimy po wejściach na, na, na Facebooka. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, Pastor Sławek just said that um, he, his main um, thing is now to make sure his sermons are going out not only to believers from church but to listeners on YouTube and on Facebook as they are bro broadcasting their sermons out and he noticed recently that his message is going further than just church members because he can see it by view viewings uh, on Facebook and likes and things like that. Uh -huh. A w ostatnim czasie też patrzymy, jak Pan Bóg pokazuje nam nowe pole działania w formie pomocy osobom, które mają problemy z alkoholem i uzależnieniami. Co jakiś czas Pan Bóg podsyła nam nowego człowieka, który ma taki problem i niesamowicie zmienia jego życie. Tak? Myślę, że w wielu świadectwach, które tam w moim raporcie misyjnym przesyłam do, 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 czy do, do Was, to, to po prostu co jakiś raz w miesiącu Zdarza się osoba, która potrzebuje takiej pomocy i zmienia swoje życie. And lately, um, Pastor Sławek noticed as well how God is using them with people who have alcohol problem and they all like very, very regularly have uh, people who are coming to them with their problem and they can see their lives change. And as also he mentioned, we can see it in a prayer letters they send in us um, regularly as well. Mm -hmm. No i tak pokrótce, w kilku zdaniach, tak wygląda służba w Inowrocławie. So that's how, how they uh, work in Inowrocław. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how long have you been meeting as a church in Inowrocław? Jak długo? How long? 
spotykamy się już od trzech lat, tak? czyli od 2017 roku systematycznie rozpoczęliśmy pracę w Kościele Droga w Wrocławiu. Obecnie mamy, no, członków mamy 15, tak? ale widzę, że, że po prostu co jakiś czas Pan Bóg nam podsyła nową osobę, która angażuje się w życie Kościoła i, i na tyle, na ile jesteśmy w stanie sami ludzi po prostu ogarnąć, na tyle Pan Bóg dodaje nam nowych, nowe osoby. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pastor Słowek said they are um, a church three years now, which is the um, same as Trinity, really. <laughs> And they have, they have 15 members at the moment, but um, they can see the growth uh, gradually uh, in the church. Uh, last of all, what is something that we can uh, thank God for you uh, and what is something that we can pray for, for you to happen? Na pewno możemy dziękować za, za naszych przyjaciół, tak? za, za y, nasze mamy wsparcie, mamy, wsparcie, tak? mamy mo- wsparcie modlitewne nie tylko mhm. za Was, tak? za, za Kościół Trinity w Scarborough mhm. y, i też za to, że Pan Bóg przyznaje się do naszej służby. Tak? Że są ludzie, którzy nam pomagają też. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would like to thank God for friends uh, who are supporting them in their ministry and pray for them and, uh, and for uh, our members too because they are really um, poświęcają się tej służbie naprawdę and for the church members who are really really sacrificing mm-hmm. their life to, to serve Okay. And how can we pray? O co się modlimy? O, o, no, o osoby, które będą oddawać swoje życie Panu Oddam Bogu. Ludzi, tak. Ale też modlimy się o, o takie miejsce, w którym moglibyśmy służyć tym osobom, które pojawiają u nas w zborze, tym osobom uzależnionym. Mhm. Dlatego, że jakby to miejsce, które mamy, nie spełnia <coughs> przepraszam, tych wszystkich warunków, które są potrzebne. I myślimy o takim hostelu dla takich ludzi gdzie mieliby taką ciągłą terapię tak. przez taki rok. Zboże nie ma prysznica, oni u nas mieszkają niektórzy, bo nie mają gdzie są bezdomni. No i nie mamy warunków, żeby mogli tam być. Śpią na materacach, myją się w miskach, po prostu... Yy, no ale nie mają gdzie nie być, mają, więc no. są, łapią się, chcą, chwytają się Pana Boga też tym wszystkim, w związku z czym no, zostajemy tylko my dla nich, nie? Tym bardziej, że jest koronawirus, na przykład na detoks ich nie przyjmują. Modlimy się o budynek i modlimy się, to są dwie rzeczy, które są jakby w naszym sercu. Ona wrócenia i... I would like to pray um, to see more people uh, become Christians and know Christ. And the second thing, they would like us to pray um, for the ministry amongst the um, alcoholics as they, um, they see the massive need of a building uh, some kind of hostel uh, where they can come and they can um, you know their hygiene needs can be met and where they can stay because uh, Ivana and Suave just said that they've been um, letting them to their own home to help help them to meet their needs but there is a massive need and there's a need for people to sell, serve and help as well so um, yeah we're gonna pray for that definitely <laughs> um, Okay. Would you like to pray for us first and then we're going to pray mm-hmm. for you? Okay. So we pray that um, the church in Scarborough, please God, give them leaders wisdom, give them peace in this hard time of coronavirus. God, please give them everything they need to, to be with you, to be close to you to feel your um, love, feel your peace in their hearts. Please, God, give them their wisdom, give them every blessing they need. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. And now I will pray for, for you and your church. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Pastor Swavek and Ivona. Um, we thank you for their, uh, their work for the gospel in in Wrocław. I just thank you that uh, even in this time of coronavirus, um, that the the work that Pastor Swavek is doing in in preaching and and, uh, his work is actually reaching further than it normally would. And I just thank you for that. And I pray that you will 
use that uh, for your gospel and your kingdom. And Lord, we do pray um, as they continue um, to work there. I do pray that you will um, help them to, to find a, a premises and uh, new ways that they can uh, meet this need uh, in the community um, with people struggling with um, alcohol addiction. Um, we just pray that you will help them to show your love um, to all the people in the community through this. And we do pray um, that in this time of coronavirus that um, the people in the church and, and the people um, in the community um, will have a, a growing desire um, to know you um, and to, to be in a loving relationship with you. Um, and, and especially for the people in the church um, that you'll, you'll grow them in this time and you'll keep them and safe and secure in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The Bible is a book that is full of promises, promises of God, and every one of them is yes in Christ. Um, and the next one we're going to have, it picks up on one of the promises of God. And we find it in uh, Revelation, at the end of the Bible, chapter 22. Um, it says this, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Um, and that is a promise of God that one day, uh, for those who trust in Jesus, we will see him face to face. And what a glorious day that will be. And what a promise to hold on to. And that is the song we're about to see. Um, all about that promise when we see your face. So let's sing that together.
morning is taken from Daniel 4 verse 19 to 37. Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds, your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. The dream is fulfilled. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what I decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. 
no one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It would be a great help for me if you would keep your Bibles open at Daniel chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible and you're looking to find it, why don't you go to a site like Bible Gateway, uh, just type in Daniel chapter 4 on the NIV and you'll be able to see uh, the words of God. This is God's book. And so with the Bible open before us, let's pray for understanding and insight, the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for your word. And we would pray that as we listen to it now, you would teach us wonderful truths about your grace, wonderful truths about Jesus, and that you would give us a heart, a heart of compassion that is like Jesus and a mind that thinks in healthy ways. And we pray that for the glory and honour of Jesus. Amen. There are some words that we never expect to find on the lips of certain individuals. Now, let me give you a few examples. Uh, would you ever expect the chief executive of Tesco to announce that people should really shop at Sainsbury's? Uh, can you imagine him saying that? And he would say it because we'll all shop at Sainsbury's because all the Tesco products are overpriced and they're just not as tasty as you can get elsewhere. Well, I don't think Dave Lewis, the chief executive of Tesco, is ever going to say that, do you? Or, or what about Boris Johnson? Imagine Boris Johnson uh, emerging from 10 Downing Street, standing on the steps of number 10. Uh, would you ever expect him to announce something like this? I wish I had voted Labour at the last general election. Well, I don't know, maybe in these strange coronavirus days, maybe he wishes uh, he had. But in normal circumstances, you would never expect the leader of the Conservative Party to say, I wish I had voted Labour. Or how about this uh, as an example? Maybe you are a bit of a Star Wars fan. It's not just the adults, the, the children and adults together. We, uh, so many of us love Star Wars. Suppose you're a Star Wars fan. Would you ever expect this to, to happen? Uh, imagine the Emperor... Would you ever expect the emperor to have one of his video calls? You know, he was having his video calls before they were cool. Uh, one of his video calls is one of the Jedi Knights, like Yoda, and saying something like this. And I just think I've been a little bit harsh on the rebels. And from now on, what I want to do is I want to stop building Death Stars and instead open up a flower shop on one of the rebel bases. Now, that's not going to happen. We never expect him to say that. At the very start of Daniel chapter 4, we hear some words from the lips of King Nebuchadnezzar that are really strange and very surprising. It's what I've called, you see on your activity sheet, the big announcement. Uh, listen or look at verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Now, why is this so strange? Uh, well, remember who is speaking the words. Uh, this is not a Jewish king. Uh, this is not a Jewish king schooled in the ways and the wisdom of the true God of the Bible. Now, the person who's speaking is the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon, way back, do you remember, about 600 years before the birth of Jesus, he believed in many different gods. And he was convinced that the God of Israel, remember the nation that he had just conquered, 
He was convinced that that God was far down the pecking order. If there's like a pecking order of gods, and he believed the Babylonian gods are up at the top and the God of Israel, well, he was down at the very bottom. Now, at the end of Daniel chapter 3, as we saw last week, after the dramatic incident in the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar had ordered that nothing bad be said about the God of Israel. That's how we left it at the end of chapter 3. But at the beginning of Daniel chapter 4, well, his words are in a different league. Because here we have, at the very beginning of Daniel chapter 4, a pagan king positively promoting the supreme power and the eternal rule of the God of Daniel, the God of the Bible. And the key question is, what has changed his mind? And that is what Daniel chapter 4 is all about. But in short, if you want to get ahead, here's the reason. He changes his mind because he has a personal experience of the power of God that radically transforms his thinking. Now, sometimes I'm asked, how, how do you know that God exists? Now, I think that's a strange question. I think it's a strange question because the vast majority of human beings around the world and throughout human history have been very religious. And that is, all throughout history and around the world, human be beings, most of us, uh, believe in some sort of higher power. Atheists, that is those who don't really believe in a God, are very much and have always been in the minority. Uh, but it's, it's a good question to ask, isn't it? Uh, what would you say? Uh, how do we know if there is a God? What's a good answer to the question? Uh, well, for me, there are lots of different reasons that come together. But let me mention three. First of all, maybe you do this as well. You look at the world around you. I see all the hallmarks of a designer. Now, what I mean by that is you look at the universe, it's big, it's complicated, it's beautiful. It, it's, you look at it and you think, can I really believe, do I have the faith to believe that all this is here by chance? Because I look at less complicated, less beautiful things in my life and I think, oh yeah, they've been designed. So I look at something bigger and more complicated and more beautiful and I think, oh, this bears all the hallmarks of a designer. At second, I look at the person of Jesus and um, I hear his claims that he is the Son of God. And I see, as I read the Bible, I see him prove by his deeds that he's just not another guy who just happens to live. I'm left persuaded that Jesus is the Son of God come down from heaven. And that's the game changer, isn't it? The Son of God comes down, he reveals the truth. And if we had been alive and around at the right time in the right place, we could have met him. And third, I have been personally changed by the power of God. Uh, you see, the God of the Bible is not, not simply a distant power that we are to gaze at and learn about. And it's not even that he's, he's just personally very powerful. Yes, a personal God. Yes, very powerful, but still at a distance. And it's not even simply uh, that this powerful personal God is present in the world, fine-tuning, turning the wheels of the universe and sustaining everything that happens around us. No, the God of the Bible is also the God who wants to be involved powerfully in our lives and personally changing us. And that's what I've experienced. And in Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar himself experiences the power of God in a personal way. He hasn't just heard Daniel speak about his God. He experiences the power of Daniel's God in a very personal way that radically changes his view of who's in charge. And it all starts with a bad dream. Verses 4 to 18. Listen to verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So what does he do? Verse 6, so I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream uh, for me. And then what happens, you can imagine the scene, can you? Um, all the wise men, the enchanters and magicians, they all parade before the king. And this time, unlike that previous dream, you remember in chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar at that time said, I'm not going to tell you my dream. Um, I want you to tell it 
to me and then interpret it. Well, in chapter four, he at least tells them the dream, but they are still clueless. Uh, they have no idea how to interpret it for him. And what this does, it leaves the stage wide open for Daniel. Uh, look at verse eight. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He's called Belshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream interpret it for me. Now the basic gist of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is that he saw a huge tree that reached towards the sky and which was the dwelling place for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now I guess if the dream had ended at this point it wouldn't have been the nightmare bad dream for the king. I'm sure if it stopped here he would have not been worried at all. It would have been a very pleasant dream to think, oh, well, maybe this is me and, uh, and I've got my empire and, and people, people come from all over the place and benefit from my loving uh, rule. But it doesn't stop here. Uh, because listen to what uh, the dream uh, is like in verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar says, In uh, the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked and there before me was a holy one. A messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. And then listen to this. Let him, notice how personal it is now. Not so much a tree is it, it's a person. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind, see how personal it is? Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. Now this is the part of the dream that really unnerved the king. Perhaps the king already had a rough idea of what it might have meant. Like many powerful rulers, he was deeply insecure and he was frightened that his power could be taken away at any moment. However, there were many parts of the tree that were unclear to him. Uh, when would this tree be cut down if he was the tree? When would it happen? What was all this about the stump that was left? Uh, what was all this about being given the mind of an animal until seven times had passed by? And those are some of the questions that I think is pretty obvious that Nebuchadnezzar wanted Daniel to answer. So the key thing now is how would Daniel respond? And it's what I've called, and you see on your activity sheet, the brave believer, verses 19 to 27. What kind of message, think about this, what kind of message do you and do we like to tell people? If you had the choice, uh, would you prefer to tell people the, the good news message or the bad news message. It's obvious, isn't it? If we had the choice, we all like to tell people good news. Let me give you a few examples. So would you prefer to come home from school and to tell your mom or your dad that either you have won a prize at school, maybe it's your work, maybe it's your sport, or that you have been expelled from your class? Now, what would you prefer? I've won a prize? <laughs> or I've been expelled. It's obvious, isn't it? We want to tell the good news. Or think about this, maybe you've got a big brother uh, or a big sister. Uh, would you prefer to tell your big brother or big sister that it's time for ice cream, or you have to go and tell them that you have accidentally fallen on top of that model that they have spent weeks and weeks building and painting and that it's now smashed to pieces? What would you prefer uh, to say? Or maybe you're one of our healthcare professionals. What kind of message do you prefer to communicate to patients? I'm sorry, there is nothing we can do. Or everything is going to be okay. Now in life, we don't always get our choice, do we? We pr prefer to be communicators of the good news message. And only a good news message. But sometimes we do have to deliver bad news. And that's what Daniel has to do in this chapter. Now I want to highlight two things from the way he does it as he prepares to communicate to King Nebuchadnezzar uh, this bad news message. Uh, there are two things that I want to highlight. First, that he is compassionate and second, that he's clear. Uh, first of all, he is compassionate. Uh, look at verse 19. 
Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. Now at first sight we may think that the reason that Daniel was terrified is because he fears the response of King Nebuchadnezzar when he receives the bad news. And we know so far, don't we, from the Bible and you can look at the history books, Nebuchadnezzar does have a reputation for being rather volatile, doesn't he? His, his emotional mood doesn't stay steady, he's up and down. But it becomes clear that the real reason that Daniel is so perplexed and so disturbed is because he really cares about the king. And he wishes the dream, with all its negative implications for the person at the centre of the dream, would be about someone else. Now the thing that strikes me is that this sort of, this sort of compassion and care is not something you can manufacture in a moment. You can't just clip your fingers and say, oh, I'm now this compassionate person and I really care for you. No, what happens in the moment we see Daniel's true heart and it is a beautiful heart of compassion and care. Here is a pagan king that is that has wrenched him from his homeland and taken him uh, to a faraway place. But Daniel has learned to have a compassionate, caring heart for this king. And that is so important because the heart of compassion and care will allow Daniel not simply to communicate a message, but to help him communicate in a manner uh, that is wise and tactful and winsome uh, and caring when he happens to speak to the king. So that's the first thing, Daniel is compassionate. And second, that he is really clear uh, notice what he says in verse uh, 22. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. He's not unclear, is it? He's not saying, well, I, I imagine that maybe you could be that tree. Maybe somebody else might be that tree. He looks him in the eye and he says, you're the tree. And his clarity continues in verse 24. Listen to this, this is the interpretation. Your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away, notice that you will be driven away, and you will live with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like the ox, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth, and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. You notice how clear he is? He's not vague, he doesn't leave an element of mystery. He has the compassionate courage to look King Nebuchadnezzar in the eye and is never easy to speak truth to power, but he tells him the truth so that Nebuchadnezzar gets it with 20-20 vision. That is, he gets it really crystal clear. Now friends, can I say to uh, you that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is amazing news. Uh, the news of the Bible that Jesus, the Son of God, um, has come into this world to live and to die to rescue us uh, from our sins so that we will be rescued from an eternal judgment um, in a place called hell because Jesus has saved us, he's alive and he's coming back to take us to the world that we all want. That message is amazing because it's not built on what we do, what we need to achieve, it's built on what Jesus has done and that means it's open to anybody to have faith in Jesus Christ. However, the message about Jesus, the gospel does have what you could call bad news elements about it. Yes, we are to tell people, and I'll tell you today if you're listening in and you're not yet a Christian, Jesus has died for you, he's died to rescue you, but you've got to say, well, from what? What do I need rescued from? Am I a good person on the road to heaven by my good deeds? Well, the message of Jesus says no. All of us are sinners, all of us have fallen short of the standards of God, and all of us deserve to be experiencing the judgment of God. That's a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit of a bad news message. And yet it continues to say that Jesus, in spite of our sin, has rescued us and wants us to have faith in him. Now perhaps 
Um, one of the reasons why many Christians are nervous about communicating the gospel is because of those bad news elements. It's not the only reason, but it, I think it is one of the big ones. And so because of this, because the message about the gospel contains these good and bad news elements, it's ultimately good news when you receive it by faith. Uh, but it has those bad news elements, and therefore I think we can learn from the example of Daniel. How did Daniel communicate that bad news message? Uh, well, he communicated with compassion and with clarity. So let me ask you a couple of questions. How is our compassion for those around us who are not yet Christians? Or if I can put it like this, why do we want to tell people the good news about Jesus? What is our motivation? Is it that I really just want to prove to the people around me uh, who maybe have mocked me in the past, who've taken the mickey out of me in the past, I don't know what it is, but do we really want to show them that we are the right people, that we are in the right and that other people are in the wrong? Hey, if that is our motivation, we will not do it with any compassion at all. Uh, the kind of question is, do we genuinely care about those around us? Do we care that they are missing out on the joy of Jesus that he offers now? And that they are heading to a painful eternity where they will experience the full force of God's judgment. Do we really care? Now the, the truth is, and maybe if you can imagine this, uh, I think I've invented this word, a sort of compassionometer. Can you imagine the compassionometer? And up here is top compassion, I care, I feel for you, and down here I couldn't really care at all, and I just want to show you that I'm right. Where are you on the compassion well, the truth is that so often that we are much lower than we want. But here's my big tip on how we can increase our position on the compassionometer. How do we increase that compassion dial in our hearts? And I think the secret is to spend more time with Jesus. Spend more time with Jesus in the place he says he will meet us in the Bible. Now, I say that to you because when you read about Jesus in the scriptures, uh, there's a, a wonderful encounter in Mark's Gospel when Jesus sees a crowd of people and it's, they're described as like sheep without a shepherd. They're kind of lost, they're all over the place, they're mucking up and messing up their life. And the response of Jesus is not to be grumpy, it's not to be saying, well, I told you you should have listened to me. The response of Jesus is that he was filled with compassion for them and as a result of the compassion, he taught them. Well, is that not what we want to be doing on the compassionometer? We want to be increasing our compassion. We want to get to the compassion of Jesus. And how do we do it? We spend time with him. And as we spend time with him in the Bible, the Holy Spirit will take these words and he will increase our position on the compassionometer. So that's the first thing. Let's learn from Daniel. And secondly, let's be clear. No one likes delivering bad news. But the good news of Jesus' rescue only makes sense against the background of sin and death and judgment. So friends, let's hold our nerve. Trust the message that God has given us to pass on to others and filled with compassion. Let's be clear. Uh, now before um, we finish and I show you uh, what I've called the bonkers king, uh, let me draw your attention to something very significant in verse 27. Listen to this. Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar, Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Notice that, isn't it? He says basically, basically to King Nebuchadnezzar, if you repent of your ways, if you repent and trust in the God of Israel, it may be, it may be that your prosperity will continue. That is, the outcome of the dream is not a certainty. It is a guaranteed outcome if Nebuchadnezzar continues in the proud direction that he is currently following. Uh, that's when he thinks that he's the centre of the universe, that he's the real ruler around here. But Daniel says to them, if you change your ways, if you acknowledge that heaven rules, that is the God of Israel rules, then... Maybe Nebuchadnezzar may not have to experience the pain uh, that is predicted in the dream. In many ways, it's a bit like the warning lights on cars. I don't know if you do that. You, you don't know how good you are with warning lights on cars, but you're out in uh, the car and then there's different lights, aren't they? But those yellow warning lights appear on the dashboard. They pop up and it's your car's way of saying to you, get it checked out before something bad happens to the car. Now, 
I'll tell you this right now, I have a very bad track record in responding to warning lights. Uh, I'm often so proud that I think there's not a problem with a car that needs to be checked out. I often assume there's a problem with the light and therefore I tend to ignore it. Uh, recently we had in our car an, an oil light uh, appeared, uh, which I eventually ignored until uh, there was actually something wrong with the car and the acceleration began to go when we were going up hills and it wasn't very good. Eventually I swallowed my pride and I took it to the mechanic. And do you know what the mechanic said to me as he examined the car? He said, there's not any oil in the engine. And therefore I think uh, this permanent damage has been done to the engine. And I'm thinking to myself, oh no, if only it actually listened to the warning light and got it checked out before the damage occurred. Do you see what's happening in Daniel chapter 4? Nebuchadnezzar gets a divine warning light. And the question is, how will he respond? And the answer, friends, is not very well. So let me show you as we finish the bonkers king at verses 28 to 37. Listen to verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence? By my mighty power, notice how proud it is, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Uh, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times it will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he pleases. Do you notice? It took 12 months before the dream became reality for this Babylonian king. 12 months. Why 12 months? Do you know why? Because the God of Israel was continuing to be gracious to Nebuchadnezzar. He continued to extend that time for repentance. The divine warning light kept on going before the damage was done. But it seems that Nebuchadnezzar presumed on God's kindness. And the occasion described here, well, this happened on a single day. The dream became a reality. Now the scientific description of what happened to this king is called lycanthropy. Now what is lycanthropy? It comes from two words, uh, two Greek words, lykos, and maybe if you're a child I can imagine what's going to happen in uh, the house as I tell you about these different uh, words. You might start making some animal sounds. Lykos comes uh, from, uh, that's the Greek word for wolf, and anthropos is the Greek word for for man. So you get lycanthropy, which literally means wolf man. You can imagine what the kids are doing now in their homes. Literally, Nebuchadnezzar has become a wolf man. That is, he, he loses his mind and behaves like an animal. But even here, even here in this terrible situation, God continues to hold out his hand of kindness. It is not game over for Nebuchadnezzar. His pride and his sin have taken them to this destructive situation. But even here, God says, if you respond, well, your prosperity will return. He will certainly have to experience the powerful, painful intervention of God, but there is still hope for a different future. Because when the king acknowledges who is really in charge, his sanity, and his prosperity will return. Now praise God, praise God that he does. And as a result of his personal encounter with the God of Israel, he tells his empire what he now believes about the God of Daniel and he, and he tells his empire how he is now going to live from this point onwards. You see that at the end of chapter 4, verse 37? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride He's able to humble. And Nebuchadnezzar knows that from painful experience. Well, how should all of this affect us? Well, let me just speak to you. If you're not yet a Christian, you're trying to find out the answers uh, of the Bible, you're trying to think through the questions of faith. If you're not yet a Christian, then please realize if the Bible is true, and it is true, then without Jesus Christ, you are heading to an eternal pit that is dark, dangerous, and deathly. And when you are in this pit, there is no way out. 
you cannot get out. You see, all of us live our lives without Jesus, like many Nebuchadnezzars. And we, we strut around thinking that we have our own empire and we decide who's in charge and it's us and we decide what we will do. And because of that, we deserve God's eternal judgment. However, the good news of the Bible is that Jesus Christ has died for us and he offers to change our eternal destiny and that is, that is the possibility and that is what happens when we put our faith in him. So if God is giving you a different day, if God is giving you another opportunity today uh, to hear this message, please do not presume on God's kindness. Uh, God is giving you another day so that you can hear the good news of rescue and that your eternal destination can be changed so that you do not cross over from this life to the next without trusting in Christ because then it's too late. But now God is kind and God invites you to put your faith in Jesus. What if we're a Christian? Well, according to the Bible, God's ways are best. But of course we are tempted along our Christian life as we run this marathon of following the Lord Jesus. We are tempted all the time, aren't we, by the ways of the world. And in his kindness, God, in, God again and again warns his people who are tempted to, to veer off the pathway of discipleship and to turn to worldly ways that are sinful and harmful. God warns us. He says, be careful. It might be in a sermon. It might be through Christian friends. It might be reading a Christian book. And we feel the weight of that in our conscience. God warns us. He says, be careful. Don't do it. Is that happening to you right at the moment? You're tempted to walk off the path of Christian discipleship. And God says, see the warning light. Please don't do it. Avoid the pain. Maybe you need to listen to that warning light before it's too late. God says, if you turn and keep focused on Christ, you will avoid that pain the consequences of walking away from Christ in this life. Or maybe you can think of the past and maybe you are currently living through the consequences of when you, you saw the warning light, you saw God's kindness and like Nebuchadnezzar, you turned it down and you decided that you knew better and you decided to walk into a situation because of your sinful pride. And that is what you're living in now. You are facing the consequences and living through the pain of past ungodly choices. Well, I've got good news for you. Even here, even when in the past we have made those ungodly choices and we're living through the consequences of those, even here in this situation, we can be like Nebuchadnezzar. We can swallow our pride. We can look to heaven and we can experience the grace of God. We can feel the tender, compassionate care of Jesus. And in this place, from this point forward, by his grace and power, we can seek to follow him afresh. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, your message in the Bible, the good news about Jesus. And I do want to pray, Father, for all who are listening right now. I do pray, Lord, that you would convince us that these words are true and that you would humble us so that we can trust in Jesus and experience his joy. And we pray all this for the glory and honour of his name. Amen. Our final song is a great Christian hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Uh, it enables us to reorientate our, our lives by, by doing the one important thing that we've got to do. Uh, we don't look at ourselves. Uh, we look up to heaven and we have a greater vision of who God is in his goodness and his kindness and his power and his glory. And when we see God properly, uh, we'll be able to live for him in the world that he has made. So let's sing together, Be Thou My Vision.
we started our service by reading some verses from Psalm 105 where we are called upon to give praise to the Lord, to sing to him, to tell of his wonderful acts, to glory in his holy name and to seek his face and to look to him for our strength. Well, as we prepare to be scattered, to live our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity to continue to sing and tell others of his wonderful deeds and to continue to look to the Lord uh, for our strength. Wonderfully, the God of the Bible is not just a Sunday God. He's 24-7 and he can help us and sustain us. So as we finish, let's pray that we continue to trust and look to the Lord for our strength. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your kindness you have gathered us and we pray that in your mercy you would empower us to live our lives for Jesus. So may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon each one of us and those whom we love, both near at hand and far away, this day and always. Amen.